So with our dear old friends, uh, Raphael Selinski, uh, coming back and uh, giving us a little presentation tonight. Uh, one of my favorite stories of all time is Raph uh, actually learned how to climb uh, ice in Michigan, and he is just killing it. And uh, if you haven't seen Will Gadd's post about uh, Raph uh, completing a his uh, longtime goal of climbing on uh, the Stanley Headwall. It's uh, just an incredible uh, accomplishment. And maybe some of you might have questions about that. And you can take those questions right to our Facebook page. And uh, Raph is going to go there afterwards and answer any questions you might have. Uh, so without uh, any further ado, uh, we will turn it over to Raph and uh, enjoy tonight's presentation uh, brought to you by Black Diamond, our title sponsor. All right. Um... Thank you very much, Michigan Ice Fest. Thank you, thank you, Bill, for uh, for keeping this this festival going, for keeping the tradition going, um, in in spite of weird circumstances. And I'm uh, I'm I'm looking forward to uh, to next time I can uh, I can be up in the uh, in the Midwest. And uh, thank you also to my longtime sponsor, Black Diamond. Uh, they've had my back for 20 years now, um, and I certainly enjoy that, and I'm very grateful for that. So without further ado, let me launch into my show for tonight. So as, um, as some of you might know, in, uh, in, my other, um, in my other life, in my other life, I'm, I'm a physics professor. And so I couldn't resist. Um, I couldn't just tell climbing stories. I wanted there to be, to be a lesson there too. But, uh, but don't, don't worry. Uh, it's, uh, there won't be an exam. And, uh, and in the end, it is mostly about the stories. But the uh, kind of the, the, the thing I wanted to talk about in addition to the stories is about this thing that we often do around climbing, which is making decisions. And I don't wanna, uh, even though the title of the slideshow um, has something to do with what to do when you don't know what to do, I don't wanna tell you what to do. Uh, so I don't wanna tell you necessarily what decisions to make, but I wanna tell you about um, how I make some decisions and uh, and maybe that uh, maybe you'll find that helpful for um, for 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 you too. And I um, I I realized um, even just this uh, this winter how a lot of my days really revolve around making decisions. So uh, so earlier this winter I guess it was still fall at the time. A friend and I went to attempt an unclimbed ice line not too far from where I live. Uh, we don't need to get too detailed about the actual location because it's still unclimbed. Um, but the decision making started right in the parking lot. Uh, one of the first things I had to do when I got out of the car and was finishing packing up, I had to go chase after my helmet as it was getting blown by the wind across, uh, across the parking lot. Uh, and so right there, we kind of look at each other. The wind is howling. The trees are being bent double. Should we, should we even bother going up there? But, uh, but the usual argument came out that we got up early. We drove all this way. We're already here. We might as well check it out. Um, so we tromped up to treeline and watched the face get creamed by spin drift and kind of looked at each other and... Um, and wondered if we should even be going up there. But then the usual argument came out, well, we're already here, we might as well, might as well check it out. Uh, so we actually uh, made it all the way to the base and, uh, and then reality kind of hit and, uh, and we realized that, uh, that there was no way we're getting on the climb that day. So, uh, so we just kind of uh, puttered around for a bit and eventually headed down. But, um, but yeah, basically the whole the whole day was uh, was defined by tr trying to decide: should we go up? Should we go down? What, what, what just what what should we do? So on that theme, the um, the first thing I guess 
we can start with is what are the kinds of decisions we make in climbing? And, uh, and I guess the decisions we make in climbing range from the very big to the very small. So to just kind of illustrate my point, let me tell you about a particular trip that I took quite a while ago now, 15 years ago now, when um, three friends and I went to attempt what was then an unclimbed peak, the uh, strangely named Kunyankish East, a uh, almost seven and a half thousand meter peak in Pakistan. And um, that was my second trip to, to the Korokorum range, but my first trip uh, when I was the most experienced one, which wasn't saying much, but um, I, guess, I guess we have to learn sometime. So we knew enough that we knew we had to acclimatize, first of all, you don't just charge up to 7,000 meters. So we went through the fairly long and sometimes painful, sometimes boring process of acclimatization, which in case you haven't experienced it, to a large extent consists of going as high as you can and then just sitting around and not doing very much at all, just basically killing time and letting your body take over and letting your body get used to the altitude. So once we, uh, once, that was out of the way, we could finally turn our thoughts to actually attempting our main objective. Now, the first big decision that, um, well, I guess after the decision of to come over there in the first place, a big decision that we had to make was once we'd seen the face was whether we actually even wanted to get on it. And when I look at, for example, images like this one, where half of the route we proposed to climb was uh, getting creamed by an avalanche. Uh, I guess I question our, our decision making, but, um, but on the other hand, I don't question it because in the end with something like risk tolerance, where we draw the line, in the end, that's a very personal decision. What, what risk we're comfortable with is a very personal decision. Um, I would just argue that if we go into those situations, we just need to go into them with our, with our eyes open. We, um, uh, we shouldn't fool ourselves about the, the potential consequences. And the consequences were, as we approached the phase for our attempt, were very, very clear. Because for about an hour, we just walked across this battlefield of avalanche debris. And, uh, and no, we did not approach at night because somehow we fooled ourselves that seracs or hanging glaciers don't collapse at night. Uh, neither did we approach at night because we figured that what you cannot see cannot hurt you. Uh, it's just that we wanted to maximize the amount of time we had that day to get as high as possible. You can uh, probably imagine what a relief it was to actually get above uh, the worst, the most, uh, the worst of the offenders here. So this uh, this giant uh, shattered uh, gla hanging glacier uh, behind us. Um, basically, once we got above it, we were mostly uh, out of its. Out, out of the danger zone. And there were all kinds of other things we would have to deal with like altitude and steepness and difficulty, but at least we wouldn't be worried about that stuff falling on our heads. So we had a pretty huge day the first day, uh, 18 hours in the go or so, uh, found actually a reasonable place to uh, spend the night, continued the second day, and uh, the second day we weren't quite as lucky. We didn't find quite as good a place to, uh, to spend the night. Um, kind of uh, made some, uh, chopped some half-assed ledges quite literally out of, uh, out of the ice. Uh, but the weather was good, uh, conditions were good. There was really no reason to go down um, until we woke up the next morning or in some cases, uh, for some of us, maybe we didn't wake up because we didn't sleep very much. 
And at that point, actually, the decision was very easy because uh, one of us could barely stand up. Um, combination of altitude and just general third world sickness. Um, to put it bluntly, we were not defeated by overhanging rock or ice, but by di bad diarrhea. Um, but uh, uh, there was, at that point, the decision was easy. There was no question that we should, that we need to go down. And it's kind of funny that the harder the climbing is, the easier it is going down. Um, so the first few rappels were actually quite straightforward because there were just steep rappels uh, down steep rock and ice. We managed to shortcut a bunch of the traverses we made on the way up. It's actually the, um, the easy terrain that uh, can be much more difficult to, to reverse. And, uh, and it was at this point too that I kind of realized the, uh, the importance of small decision making. So we were kind of, even though there was four of us, we were essentially each on our own, just down climbing this um, kilometer high, 60 degree sheet of snow and ice. And at one point, um, as I was kind of crabbing down the, uh, the slope, I looked up and I saw these, this rock uh, coming for me. And I just had this split second to make a decision whether to duck left or right. And I forget which way I ducked, but it was the right way to duck. And uh, um, Eamon, a friend of mine who was uh, kind of not far from me, um, all he said was, uh, good call. Um, I don't think I can take the credit for that. It was just sheer dumb luck at that point. So you'd think that after um, that experience between rockfall and uh, high altitude diarrhea that would be done with it. But, but of course, when you go all that way and you train and you spend all this money and in the end, you just have these dreams, you, uh, you, don't, wanna, you don't give up that easily. And so after another uh, week or two, we headed back up on the face. Unfortunately, by then, um, summer was in full swing, and um, never before since have I seen um, what, what was ultimately a giant ice climb in that bad a shape. Uh, there were uh, what were giant rivers, essentially, just cascading down the ice fields. Um, rocks were just raining down. We, um, we just basically tried running from one sheltered spot to another. It's, uh, it was, a, um, again, just sure dumb luck that, uh, that one of us didn't get brained. We made it to um, that same spot that, uh, that we uh, used the previous time for our bivy. And there we had this big discussion about what we should do. And that kind of brings up another point about decision-making is that, uh, once you're not done making decisions, once you decide to head up, you're, um, you're constantly reevaluating. And so we had this big discussion there. Should we keep going or should we go down? And um, probably not the smartest thing. I was actually suggesting that, well, um, the higher we get, the, the colder it's going to be. So maybe all this um, running water and, and falling rock will, uh, will calm down and will get above the, the, the danger zone. Uh, my partners uh, in the end um, convinced me that that was not a good idea. And uh, under the cover of darkness, while it was still cold enough, um, we, we escaped and, um, and managed to, to make it down safely. So, that brings me to the next chapter in this discussion about uh, in uh, sort of in storytelling and this discussion of how to make decisions, um, which is, should you be making decisions with your brain or with your gut? And um, given that I'm a physics professor, you can probably guess which way I lean. Uh, so let me, let me tell you about, let me tell you a story about, uh, um, one time when I made decisions with my gut. So this was early on in, uh, fairly early on in my climbing career. Uh, mid nineties, I was just getting into uh, some bigger Alpine routes and one particular route that was on my radar at that point 
was something called the shooting gallery. The name should give you a bit of a clue uh, in the on Mount Andromeda in the Columbia ice fields in the Canadian Rockies. And <laughs> these days, I probably wouldn't have even left the parking lot the day when we went to, uh, to climb it. Um, it was um, early September, it was still really warm. The, uh, the ice that um, is supposed to be part of the route was uh, more slush than anything. You can actually see that ice in the uh, corner of the photo here. Um, again, these days I would take one look at it and um, think of doing something else. But back then I just kind of looked at it and I figured, well, that's just what you got to do. So I start, started up it without a single piece of protection between me and the belay. Uh, just basically hooking little rock edges um, underneath the slush and eventually the inevitable happened and I um, fell off and uh, uh, there was a, another learning experience. I realized that uh, self-arresting with your front teeth is not a good idea. Um, my partner uh, just said, well, it's just as well you fell off when you did and didn't get any higher. Um, and it was really not a case of particular boldness. Uh, it was again this, uh, um, I just wasn't even questioning where I was. I wasn't, um, I wasn't making rational decisions. I just really, really, really wanted to climb this thing and let that override everything basically. Now you think at that point, I would have had enough brains to actually head down. Um, but in fact, uh, no, um, we actually kept going. And um, when we got into the upper section of the climb into the upper gully or couloir, um, a, uh, a front moved in with rain and lightning. Uh, lightning was striking the rock towers. You can see above me here, um, again, raining more rocks down the couloir. All in all, it was just a, uh, just kind of a bad day in terms of making one bad decision after another. I think starting with the decision of just leaving the car and, uh, and heading up. And that brings me to one of my personal heroes in climbing, George Lowe. Um, a lot of you might have heard about George Lowe, a pioneer of alpine climbing in the, uh, in the Tetons, in Alaska, uh, in my uh, personal favorite range, the Canadian Rockies, in the Himalaya as well. And another reason why George has always been a huge um, role model for me is that, um, like me, uh, George is a working physicist. And so um, it was always a huge inspiration, inspiration for me that he combined uh, this career as a physicist with climbing. And um, well, you can, uh, you can see the quote right here. Uh, I think George uh, has some pretty strong opinions about how you should make decisions in the mountains. And, um, and I've definitely, uh, on that, that particular day on shooting gallery, I don't think I quite lived up to that, but I, uh, I've definitely tried to live up to, uh, to that saying since. Now, making rational decisions does not necessarily mean um, backing off or backing out. And an example of that was a trip that my friend Ian and I took to Pakistan in um, 2013. As all trips to Pakistan, uh, we started in Islamabad after a few days spent in the capital, taking care of logistics and just generally waiting around for things to line up. We got into a van and um, started up the, uh, started for the long drive up the Korakoram Highway, the uh, gateway to, uh, to the Korakoram. Now, just a few 
hours up the drive, we got word through our liaison officer, uh, Lieutenant Farhan, who you can see on the right here, that there had been a terrorist attack on a climbing base camp, not a climbing base camp where we're going, but another, but another climbing base camp, the base camp below Nanga Parbat. And at that point, we didn't exactly know what was going on, what had happened. Later, um, we found out that 11 people, um, 10 foreign climbers and a local cook um, were basically executed by uh, local militants. As you can imagine, our first reaction was absolute horror. And, um, and again, our first gut reaction was, let's get the hell out. Let's just go home. Um, you know, forget, the, uh, forget the trip, forget the expedition. Let's just go, go back to the Rockies. But then we started thinking about it. And, and for sure, desired factored into it. Uh, we started thinking about it that um, at that point, um, it was um, my fourth trip to Pakistan, Ian's third. We like to think that we understood the country a bit, that we understood some of the differences in particular, and that the region we were going was a completely different region, completely different ethnic and religious area from the area where the attack happened. And so we decided in the end, after um, a few days of deliberation, to go ahead with the trip. And um, in the end, our, our decision was, was vindicated. We, throughout the trip, once we got ourselves up to the mountains, to this region called Baltistan, which is a very, very different area from where the attack happened, we always felt completely safe and experienced nothing but um, friendship and hospitality from the locals. Now, of course, in the back of our minds was to um, our desire that we had come all this way to attempt this particular mountain on this occasion was something called K6 West. So for sure, desired factored into it. But, um, but I like to think that, uh, that we had brains enough that, um, that if we had decided that it was uh, unreasonable to continue, that, uh, that, would, that in the end, they would have overruled the desire and we would have pulled the plug. Now, um, it was good to come to face with just purely mountain hazards, and of course, those are the ones we're mostly talking about here. And um, I went there with a very open mind. Um, we, of course, I had in fact seen the mountain before because my first trip to Pakistan was to that, to that general area. So I'd seen it before. It was very much an open question in my mind whether there was a reasonable route up the mountain, whether there was something that was not death on a stick. Um, but we, um, we spent three weeks in base camp acclimatizing and just watching the mountain, um, watching it avalanche after storms and slowly convinced ourselves that there was a reasonable way up the mountain and then set off on what for Ian and me was one of the greatest adventures of our lives. We um, spent some four days climbing um, what were some of the most difficult pitches we'd ever done in the mountains. And on the fifth day, we walked up to this unclimbed 7,000 meter summit, um, up quite appropriately perhaps, uh, that that day we were high enough that off in the distance, like a ghost on the, on the horizon, we could actually see Nanga Parbat, which was kind of this, uh, this sort of uh, uninvited ghost that uh, kind of haunted that, that whole trip. Now, one thing that, um, that always informs at least my decision-making and imagine for a lot of you too, is, um, is whether 
the 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 risks we're running are of our own making or not so um so in climbing we talk about um objective and subjective risk so uh so to put it bluntly objective risk is when you're worried about something falling on your head and subjective risk is when you're maybe worried about falling yourself and a classic example of a climb um, again, not too far from uh, where I live in the uh, Columbia ice fields, is this famous ice climb called Slipstream, which in itself is not that difficult, but is overhung by the edge of the Columbia ice fields, which um, periodically breaks off and sweeps down the route. So again, a, a classic example of objective hazard. This photo, I think in particular, uh, kind of tells the story of the objective hazard. So slipstream is the, uh, the stream of ice, um, the, the stream of blue green ice on the right. And um, above the capping the wall, you can see the, uh, the blue seracs, so, so the, the freshly calved ice and the cornices capping it all. Now, even with objective hazard, though, um, you can still approach such hazards and make decisions in a way that that minimize that that hazard. And one way to to do that is to try to spend as little time as possible exposed to it. And so one way to do that is to get the climb done as quickly as possible. And so on this particular occasion, which was the first time I climbed the route uh, with my friend Kim, we decided that um, we would basically simul-climb the whole route, which meant that we would not put in fixed belays where one person would uh, stop and belay the other one, but they basically would just keep moving together with um, maybe two or three ice crews between us. And so maybe sacrifice a bit of safety because simul climbing is definitely a less safe way to climb. But we figured it was a worthwhile trade off because it would just minimize the amount of time we would spend exposed to all these things hanging over our heads. Again, um, we're more worried about stuff falling on our heads than we were worried about falling off ourselves. And so in the end, we managed to make it safely to the final Serac barrier, at which point we actually felt a lot safer because now we were threatened by a much smaller uh, chunk of real estate above us. And five hours after starting up, we were on top again, having maybe made some uh, compromises, but in the end, I guess if you, again, if you, one decision might be that you simply choose not to climb a route that has that kind of hazards associated with it. But if you do decide to climb it, then we felt we made what was a reasonable compromise. Now I mentioned this business of subjective hazard. So subjective hazard, um, the way I see it, it's, it's hazard that's of our own making. So we go up a route where we're not worried about things falling on us. We're not worrying, worried so much about the environment. We're quite literally worried about falling off. And Bill mentioned this place, the Stanley Headwall. So the Stanley Headwall, for those of you um, who haven't visited, you should um, once, uh, once this whole COVID thing is done. It's um, one of the greatest ice and mixed venues in the Canadian Rockies and in my uh, perhaps biased opinion, uh, the world. It's an incredible concentration of climbs. And uh, actually just earlier this winter, I managed to uh, finally complete it, what I think is pretty much every route uh, on the Stanley Headwall. Um, but because I've been climbing there for so long, um, it, um, 
when something obscure and rarely formed came in, I felt quite motivated to get on it and, um, and get, it, get it done. And such was the case a few years ago when this very rarely formed line called the Sound and Fury came in. Now, um, it was one of those concoctions of ice kind of just barely, barely there, where um, were you, um, as someone, um, a lot of you might know, uh, Scott Backies from the Twin Cities, as Scott uh, says, um, it's not the unclimbable uh, pitch that scares him. It's the one where he can, where you can just barely squeak by. And uh, and I, I very much, I thought um, when I when I read that, I thought uh, Scott really put his finger on something there. Um, and on a climb like this, basically you start up and maybe a few meters up, you get a shitty ice crew and it's not great, but it's kind of just enough to keep you going. And then a few meters higher, you get a shitty knife blade behind a, a rock flake. And it's not great, but you convince yourself that, to, to keep going. And really on a, on a climb like this, you're sure you're trying to protect it. You're, you're trying to uh, put in gear in case you do fall off, but really, the the best your best defense on something like this is not falling off in the face in the first place and so this is what i mean by uh controlling the subjective hazards that if probably if i tried this route um when i first got into ice climbing um if i had gotten any ways up it i would have i would have hurt myself and um i like to think that when i did this route that I was sufficiently well prepared that I made it into a maybe not into a safe proposition but at least into a reasonable proposition. If you look closely here even the second pitch where the ice had grown a little thicker it was still thin enough that we were we were tying off even uh, even shorter screws and that brings me to yet another aspect of decision making um, and subjective hazards, uh, something that's very much under our control. And that is the people we climb with. Uh, and what I mean by that is that uh, there are some days when we just go for a casual day and we, go out, we can go out with, any, with anyone. But on days when, um, when we're trying something serious, um, it's good to go with people you trust. And on this occasion, it was uh, Bayard from uh, North Conway and Nick from England, uh, two of the best people I've ever climbed with. Now, another chapter in this business of trying to make smart decisions concerns keeping a margin of error. And what I mean by that is that when we're making decisions about climbing, whether it's about um, whether to head up a freestanding pillar on Grand Island or uh, uh, head up a big mountain in the Karakoram, in the end, we know some stuff, but there's a lot we don't know. And so I'm, I'm a big believer in keeping a bit of a margin of error so that even if you're wrong, even if you happen to be wrong, things don't go catastrophically wrong. So on that particular occasion, um, I was really <laughs> reminded of that. Uh, so, so a little over two years ago, two summers ago, uh, my friend Alec and I went to Pakistan yet again uh, to try this peak on the right, uh, the unclimbed Pumarikish East. Uh, spoiler alert. It's still unclimbed in case you're interested. Again, we knew the drill uh, that to climb something technical uh, close to 7,000 meters, we needed to be acclimatized. And so again, we spent uh, the first few weeks in base camp going higher and higher with some real highlights, um, including uh, this beautiful ridge traverse surrounded by some of the most spectacular mountain, ce mountain scenery you could imagine. And some real low lights too. Um, again, acclimatizing 
in, inevitably involves um, feeling really, really shitty uh, at times uh, when your head is pounding and your guts are churning and, uh, you know, maybe not literally, but figuratively, you wish you could die. <laughs> Uh, but we got over we got over all that. We got well acclimatized, and finally it was time to um, to pack up and to head for the main attraction. Now, just getting to the base of the main attraction um, was wasn't straightforward. It was guarded by um, by a quite uh, quite nasty uh, bit of glacier. But we managed to find a way around it, even if the way around it involved some, uh, some pretty real rock climbing. And we finally stood on the glacier um, below the, uh, the face we wanted to climb. And at that point, we realized that in the almost month and a half we'd been in base camp, again, Summer had come and what was beautiful, uh, clean ice when we first got to base camp uh, had turned into nasty, dirty, um, gritty, wet rock slabs. And so we looked at this and we kind of, we tried to figure out a way of getting up it like, well, maybe if we climb it at night when, when the water isn't flowing and the rocks aren't falling. Um, but I just had a really hard time convincing myself. Um, I was reminded of my er one of my early alpine climbing mentors, Jim, um, who would always put decision-making in this kind of a light. He would say, if something happens to us here, if we go up and something happens, something bad happens, are people gonna say, what were they thinking? And I couldn't, <laughs> and I kind of thought of that. And I, and I thought that if we go up there and there's a very good chance that something bad is gonna happen. I mean, there's a chance that everything will work out. But there's a good chance that something bad will happen. And, um, and people will say, what were they thinking? And so as hard as it was, we pulled the plug. Um, I think it was especially hard for my partner, Alec, um, being 20 years younger, maybe he is, more driven than I am. Um, I guess the way I think about those things too is that um, when, we, when we spend a good chunk of our lives climbing, when it's this lifelong passion, uh, we spend all this time in the climbing and going to the mountains. And if you keep rolling the, the dice, um, and if you just, if you, uh, if you make that margin really, really skinny every time, then one of those times something really bad is going to happen. And so that brings me to the last chapter in this story, which is when things do go sideways, um, is it bad judgment or is it bad luck? So the story I want to tell you here was is about a... Um, a climb that uh, my friend Karen and I did a little over 10 years ago. So the northeast face of Mount Kefren is one of the great roadside faces, faces on the on the Ice Fields Parkway, uh, which some of you may have driven up, driven up and down. Uh, probably the most famous route on that face is something called the Wild Thing. But on that occasion, we had our um, our eyes and our hearts set on a new line that we eventually called the Dog Lake Couloir. So we uh, started up under beautiful blue skies. Uh, we knew that the climb would take us two or three days. So, um, so we didn't get, we got an early start, but not a crazy early start. The climbing went really fast until it slowed down <laughs> once, uh, once we got to the steeper stuff. And at that point, it really, really slowed down. This kind of climbing, the sort of thinly iced snow covered rock is very demanding and very time consuming. But we, uh, we made good progress, um, actually found some snow deep enough for a snow cave and had an amazing night's sleep in the snow cave. Um, in fact, we slept so well, we overslept. 
and had a bit of a shock when we kicked open the, uh, the door of the snow cave um, to see that in spite of the per perfect snow uh, forecast, it was actually storming. And at that point, we were high enough up the face that um, we thought it was actually safer to go up than down. So uh, we had kind of walked into a bit of a trap. So at that point, the climb turned into a bit of a upward retreat. And to make stuff um, even more serious, um, the climbing was actually really hard and really demanding. And both Pierre and I took long lead falls, which is not something you want to do uh, more than a thousand meters up an alpine face in winter. But again, um, it just, we're just making, at that point, we're just making the, be the, the, the best of a bad situation. Um, you can barely see Pierre uh, as he's coming up this particular pitch in this photo. Um, he's just getting pounded by the, uh, by the falling snow and by the avalanches, which fortunately at that point were not far from the top. And so the avalanches were not that big. They were, we knew there, there would be way, way bigger down below. So after um, two days and another night of climbing, we topped out. And at that point, we um, again were in this shitty situation where uh, we had to get down somehow, um, down these freshly um, loaded sl uh, slopes. And again, you could, um, you could say that it was just um, bad luck that we were in this situation, but um, I would disagree with that. I would just say that, um, that when, you, when you climb, and especially when you do things which are, which are hard or which are big, in the end, you're taking calculated risks. Um, every time you go out, you hope that um, everything works out, but in the end, you are taking calculated risk and sometimes things don't pan out the way, the way you hope. Uh, now, in the end, it all worked out. Um, we really, by all rights, we should have gotten avalanched on the descent, but we didn't. Um, and we made it safely down. Um, and again, a reminder that, um, that maybe you want to, that sometimes you get lucky, and, uh, and you, but you don't account on that luck too, too often. So um, I'm ending this on kind of a kind of a grim note. Uh, so so just to uh, to take a break from that uh, before I before I stop, uh, let me just say that the way I think about climbing in general is that in the end, climbing is a completely silly activity, and in the end, if it's not fun on some level, there uh, there's really no point in doing it. So. Uh, so let's 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 keep it fun. I hope um, I hope we all have a lot of fun uh, climbing through this winter and and uh, maybe sometimes forgetting about everything else that's going on around us. Thank you very much. Thank you, Raphael. Always amazing to see uh, all the climbs you're doing and uh, the knowledge that you can pass on to uh, uh, all of our good folks and family here in Michigan. So uh, wish you were here in person with us. Uh, so do I. I really look forward to having you come back uh, real soon. So for sure. Um, once again, everyone, uh, Raphael will be uh, heading over to our uh, Facebook page, uh, answer any questions you might have uh, for him. Uh, and uh, once again, thank you to everyone uh, for tuning in. Uh, to all of our presentations. We have had uh, several or, uh, questions of when we're gonna open up registration for the 2022 event. Uh, and so look at our uh, social media outlets uh, for around May this year. Uh, so we're really excited to bring you a lot of surprises and have a really big celebration uh, for when we can see everyone again. So once again, thank you all for tuning in. <laughs>